Hello again everyone and welcome back to the Underground. This is the Intel update for Wednesday the 1st of March 2023 and as usual it is being recorded on the day prior on the 28th of February. Sorry it's been a while since an update. I have been completely overwhelmed with springtime chores and trying to get a garden in the ground for what is certain to be a very interesting summer. So let's get right to it. Gonna be moving pretty fast today because there's a lot of incidents and I don't really know what to think about them so I'm just gonna list off some stuff to think about. Starting off with the northeast region, really the incidents that have caught my eye over the past few days and weeks have been suspicious deaths. So we have had the murder of Councilman Eunice Dwumfor in New Jersey on the 3rd of February. We also had the murder of Russell Heller, another Republican councilman uh, in New Jersey. Uh, he was murdered on the 8th of February. Uh, moving over to New York, we have had the suspicious death of uh, billionaire financier Thomas H. Lee, who was found with a self-inflicted gunshot wound in his uh, Fifth Avenue office. And also, uh, moving outside of the country, but it's kind of related to New York as well, the death of French modeling agent Jean-Luc Brunel, who was found dead in his prison cell in Europe, again under very suspicious circumstances. So, starting off with a lot of very suspicious incidents for the Northeast. Moving down to the southeast, we have a lot of infrastructure concerns. Starting off with Tennessee, on the 22nd of February, there was a uranium fire at the Y-12 National Security Facility in eastern Tennessee. This facility, also colloquially known as Oak Ridge, is where a lot of our nuclear research gets uh, conducted for military uh, nuclear weapons and things like that. So we don't have a whole lot of details regarding this incident because it's such a secret facility. All we know is quite literally there was a fire involving uranium of some kind. Of course, the U.S. government has come out and stated that there is no contamination or any problems whatsoever, but again, trust is running in short supply with regards to U.S. government agencies and contamination. Fortunately, radiological concerns are fairly easy to detect with decently low-cost sensors, so it's pretty easy to detect if there's some kind of uh, cover-up operation going on, unlike uh, chemical operations, as we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Moving down to Florida, we have two industrial incidents, the first of which occurred on the 19th of February, which was an industrial fire at the Corvanta Recycling plant, basically a plant that organizes and recycles and sorts various recyclable materials. This fire burned and smoldered for a little over five days and caused a lot of air quality concerns for southern Florida. Again, highlighting the importance and the difficulty with addressing some of these more hazmat type concerns. The other more serious incident in Florida occurred on the 21st of February and was an industrial explosion at a trucking conglomerate. Local media reports that the initial blast seat of this uh, explosion occurred occurred in a welding shop that was part of a larger trucking uh, industrial park that made a lot of uh, parts and fabrication regarding uh, commercial trucking. This blast killed two workers and wounded three more. And as of right now, the cause of the blast is unknown. Moving over to Arkansas, a rather coincidental event occurred which involved the death of chemical inspectors that were inbound to the Ohio crisis. So a small plane carrying executives and chemical inspectors inbound to the Ohio uh, chemical crisis crashed uh, shortly after takeoff from Bill and Hillary Clinton National Airport just outside of Little Rock. Again, the victims were mostly executives and senior staff who were heading to Ohio to supervise uh, the chemical incident there. As far as why the plane crashed, we really don't know whether it could have been a factor, but again, I just wanted to mention it because it is highly suspicious. And speaking of Ohio, moving up to the Midwest, we are certainly coming up against Murphy's Law with regards to the East Palestine chemical incident. We're seeing reports of rainbow snow falling in Canada and white powder covering uh, houses, buildings, and property. Uh, as far away as Maryland, so it's really hard to say what's going on with this because, again, the EPA is saying that there's basically nothing wrong. Also, Ohio's National Guard leadership finds themselves in hot water regarding uh, recent body cam footage that was released uh, surrounding the incident that involved the arrest of a reporter. So, uh, as we know, right after this crisis kind of became public, a reporter was arrested at a press conference uh, under kind of questionable circumstances regarding why they were arrested. Either way, the events surrounding that arrest are kind of up for debate still. But what is a lot more clear is the actions of Major General John Harris, uh, who initially stated that he 
wasn't really involved uh, with that uh, kind of scuffle involving the arrest of that reporter uh, at the beginning of this crisis. However, recent body cam footage, uh, the link of which you can view below, uh, recent body cam footage has confirmed that he actually is the one who initiated physical violence against a reporter uh, and actually uh, state or, or local law enforcement actually had to restrain him and prevent him uh, from attacking the reporter. So, so again, when you've got the leader of a state's National Guard trying to uh, go after reporters with physical violence at a press conference, it just doesn't look very good. But either way, you can look at the footage and see, uh, see for yourself what happened. Also in Ohio, a sort of unrelated incident, but also kind of similar, was the I. Schumann & Company metal foundry explosion that occurred in Bedford, just outside of Cleveland. It's really not clear as to what caused this explosion, but we do know that this involved the explosion of a kettle of molten metal at the metal foundry there in Bedford. One person was killed and 13 were wounded in the blast, which consumed uh, uh, the building in uh, fire. Obviously, you know, it's molten metal, so this is a uh, very serious incident. Again, not much more details are known other than that event occurred, and I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what the official cause of that blast was. We, we just don't know much more than that. In keeping with the theme of explosions, we have a lot more uh, explosions that have occurred in the southwestern region, specifically in Texas and in Mexico. Uh, on the 23rd of February, Pemex, which is a state-run petroleum company out of Mexico, suffered three uh, separate fires at three separate facilities, one of which was uh, just outside out of Houston in Deer Park, uh, Texas. All three of these facilities serve different purposes. The first and catastrophic fire occurred at a petroleum storage facility down in Veracruz, Mexico. The second fire occurred at a processing facility also in Veracruz, but also some distance away from the other fire, from the first fire. And the third fire occurred in Deer Park, Texas at a processing facility. So again, Pemex does not exactly have a good history with regards to, you know, accident prevention. They have a long history of, of workplace violations and industrial accidents. However, three separate fires at three separate facilities all on the same day is pretty suspicious, so I wanted to mention it. So that's pretty much all I have for the United States. I'm sorry to kind of gloss over half the country, but I wanted to move to international stuff while I'm still working on those slides. I wanted to briefly check back in with Turkey and mention that uh, the situation regarding the recent Turkish earthquakes uh, has gotten a lot more serious. The death toll so far has uh, increased to over 50,000, uh, with millions of people displaced uh, on both the Turkish side of the border and in Syria uh, surrounding these earthquakes. There have been multiple uh, aftershocks and multiple subsequent earthquakes, uh, which have just made the situation completely horrific. So the situation in Turkey and in Syria is most certainly not good. Now the next thing I'm about to say I really didn't want to talk about just yet because I honestly don't know what to think about it um, and it doesn't really change my own personal uh, preparation efforts either way but since so many prominent politicians throughout Europe and throughout the local area are talking about it I thought I, I really should address it now and that is the local claims that this earthquake might not have been so natural in origin. This is what I consider to be a lightning rod issue. Very few people are willing to talk about it, and I myself don't really want to talk about it, because you've got a couple of things going on here. You have a very long history of very little evidence uh, coming out surrounding these things, in combination with very, very strong and very serious claims, right? And with regards to earthquakes potentially having a man-made origin, this is one of those things where it's impossible to prove. There's going to be no information leaked to the public about this kind of thing, and all we have have to go off of our opinions, really. And all of this occurring in a situation where tens of thousands of people are dying is just not a recipe for success, to be honest. But people are talking about it, so I have to mention it now. Uh, there was a Romanian senator who briefly mentioned, or actually mentioned at great length, uh, that this might have had some involvement from the United States, which I ordinarily would just kind of dismiss uh, or, or not really grant too much credence to. Some random politician in a random country in Europe is not really proof of anything, right? But since then, the former mayor of Ankara, the capital of Turkey, right, uh, has come out and, and made similar claims. Uh, so this guy has a long history in Turkey. He's not the current mayor of, of Ankara, but he was mayor for a very long time. I think he either stepped down or lost an election in 2017. So kind of a pretty big name in local politics, and uh, he was suggesting also that there might have been man-made origins to this, to this earthquake that hit 
their country. Now, again, this is a lightning rod topic, and it is sure to stir up a, a lot of discourse on either side of the situation. Uh, so I thought the, the only reason that I wanted to bring this up is because I think it's a great way of addressing other lightning rod topics that might come up in the future. Because as we have seen over the past few years, there have been a lot of, of really bad things occur. And I'm finding, as, ma as many of you are finding, that a conspiracy theory being proven to be true doesn't really help us that much. Um, because it doesn't really help stop the next one, and it doesn't really help shape our preparations for the future. So, again, I wanted to remind everyone to take everything with a grain of salt. And you can acknowledge these very serious things, right? And, you know, years down the line, we may be proven to be correct or incorrect or, or whatever. Years down the line, the truth may come out, but it's certainly not going to come out now. And we need to be thinking on a shorter term basis for these kinds of things. It doesn't really do us a whole lot of good to sit back with a, you know, moral or intellectual superiority about, you know, well, I knew this was going to happen two years ago. It doesn't really help us a whole lot if we didn't take any preparations to make sure that this that we're not affected by things like this. So again, when it comes to earthquake preparedness, I think that this situation in Turkey, regardless of the origin, is very, very sobering uh, with regards to those who may live in earthquake-prone areas. Just for me personally, I lived in the Pacific Northwest for a few years, and I was actively a part of you know emergency preparedness for uh, my you know, local area and for my state as well. And it was pretty shocking to me that I was one of just a handful of people actually interested in earthquake preparedness. Literally, I, I've, I was told directly to my face by state level uh, emergency managers saying that their earthquake preparedness plan was to call the next state over. That was basically it. And the reason for that kind of attitude and funding allocation being basically zero was that anything that they build is going to get destroyed anyway, so it's not even worth trying to prepare in the in the first place. Now again, things may have changed. It's been a few years since I lived there. But again, these kinds of incidents highlight just how behind the times we are for everything from basic natural disaster preparedness to civil defense and things like that. Again, a kind of theme that's coming out is that all of these older issues, everything, from, you know, again, from civil defense to hazmat concerns are very much something that we as a society and as a westernized, you know, culture haven't really figured out. And what we have figured out is either very expensive or very difficult to do. So we will most certainly keep Turkey and Syria in our thoughts and prayers as we move forward because this is, again, a very, very horrific disaster. Moving on to the Far East, I briefly wanted to check in with our invasion potential for China. Uh, there haven't really been too many additions to our stoplight charts here. As we can see, I, I did add airspace incursions to our emergency indicators, uh, indications and warnings for an imminent Taiwan invasion but again, there's really not been a whole lot. Same thing with the foreign powers indicators. We haven't really seen too much strategic uh, power plays being made in the local area with the exception of, you know, obviously responding to the Chinese spy balloons from a few weeks ago. But really the biggest uh, thing that kind of caught my eye was the soft criteria. So China has been observed to slow foreign oil exports. Again, uh, kind of a... Um, what we call a dual use kind of situation where this can have a benign purpose, but it also could be a preparation for a conflict. We now have the data for January of 2023, which indicates very strongly that uh, Chinese oil exports dipped around that time frame. Now, again, the benign reason behind this is that it's the Lunar New Year uh, and Chinese uh, oil exports usually dip around that time of year as as domestic uh, demand increases, right? Your, your local citizenry uh, starts traveling more more during the holiday. It's a huge travel holiday and your your oil exports slow as your domestic demand increases. So again, this is not necessarily an indicator uh, by itself uh, that China is starting to stockpile oil, but it could also be a great way for China to slowly start adding to their strategic oil reserves. So on that note, I think we'll call it a day. Sorry if I moved a little fast through this today, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that's occurred and I don't really have a whole lot of answers for you uh, with regards to to what has occurred. Really, at the most, all I can do is point out that this stuff occurred and you can draw your own conclusions from there. But as time goes on and as it becomes a lot more harder to detect what's, you know, true and what's false, I guess a return to a sort of simplicity really kind of helps out a lot. 
I am personally at the stage where there's it doesn't really matter how bad things get. It this it's not really going to change my uh, my goals too much. Um, I'm still trying to move forward as best I can, and uh, you know, really being aware of very serious things occurring around the country is is good to know. But uh, in the long run, really, I'm just kind of adopting a more a simple view of things. So hopefully that helps a lot of you kind of keep keep your head on right and keep moving forward because uh, we're most certainly uh, in the long haul now. So thank you all again for watching and thank you for all of your support over the years and we will see you next time and as always fight in the shade